stories. Think useful twilight. That was my first edition. Last year, I broke it into two books, starting my second edition. Think stories like what would happen if a vampire owed child support? What if a mad genius got jilted on her senior prom? This went that way. So, this story is from the first of my second editions called well, Duty Calls. And the unlikely hero is the theme of Unheroic. Think like, um, what if a patriot with a bit of, um, well, shall we say, bloodlust? has to save the day. I ejected the mag and slipped in my last one. My pain tolerance was shot. The blurred vision implied massive blood loss. While I wasn't afraid of my situation, I didn't dare look down. Slumped against someone else's tombstone, I knew that if I looked down, my brain would realize that I was dying, and that would be that. Dying could come later. A few minutes from now would be just fine. Joe needed me, which is why I stepped into the pain and rose to my feet with shaky hands and wildly feet. I heard more gunshots ring off in the distant fog shroud at night. I stepped over my kills and stubbornly headed toward my only friend. Joe was the one person in this world who believed in me, who understood my sins and why I did what I did for God and country. A sense of duty was hard to keep these days. After the towers fell, I stepped up and became a Marine. My soft morals and impressive wits earned me a fast track into black ops, where I became something of a household name. Didn't want to kill so many people. Some of them could have been spared. The sad thing about the Middle East was that anyone not in diapers was a threat. Then again, I'd killed babies too, just for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Had I stayed in college and gotten that MBA, I'd probably be some cold-hearted corporate prick with a wife, two kids, and a mistress. Instead, I'd help topple governments. Somewhere along the line, Uncle Sam wrote me off. A new administration with a more humane foreign policy. Some soup looked over my file and batted me out. They came to lock me up, and I let them. I wasn't a monster. I was a patriot. I told them to reactivate me when they needed me. My confidence scared them, but we both knew that day would come. Six weeks in the hole, and I came up. Flat out suicide mission. Someone needed to go into Iran and extract a priest who was arrested for espionage. As it turned out, this priest really was a spy and had vital secrets in his head. I gave them a grocery list of Optech and asked for backup. The Optech was denied, and instead of a team, they gave me Joe Wells. Unlike me, Joe had a conscience. Ten years my senior, he was a drunk washout with tons of contacts, field experience, and something of a death wish. Someone paired us together thinking that both of us and the priest would die in a botched rescue attempt. Those secrets died with the priest, the pricks in Washington, with in mind. <laughs> we went in, sized up the situation, and then poisoned the priest. After his death, we swapped him out for a double. Apparently, Joe had a taxidermist friend who dabbled in post-mortem plastic surgery. When the rescue came to light, Tehran was furious. Langley was awed. Washington made our partnership permanent after that incident. A functional madman and a dysfunctional alcoholic. We did the suicidal ops in impossible missions, usually having to steal the funds to pull them off. It was a fun learning experience. Joe was the brains, I was the talent. We had a 41.7% success rate, which was near miraculous. Could have gone on for years, except it didn't. Someone leaped us out again. This time, a kill team was waiting at my loft. American and well-trained, they almost got me. I got them back. Took their gear and weapons. Rather than patch myself up, I pinged Joe's cell phone and raced over to save him. Tactical sense told me to leave him behind. My sense of duty refused to listen. So here I was, dying in bloody droplets, fairly certain that Joe was already dead. As it turned out, I walked into an aftermath of a capture. Joe was on his stomach getting flex cuffed. For some reason, they wanted him alive. While my attackers were dressed in heavy tactical gear, Joe's foes were in civilian dress. Four of them were dead, the fifth pinned Joe to the ground. The last one was calling for extraction when I put two rounds to her head. The guy cuffing Joe gawked up at me as he went for his gun. I dropped him and fell down. Get ghost, I managed to ease. Joe swallowed hard. When we paired up, I avoided the mistakes of his past handlers. Rather than trying to get him off the bottle, I forced him to work out. The balding, pot-bellied agent lost 30 pounds and picked up 20 back in muscle. He quit smoking, used mild steroids, and limited his drinking to the expensive stuff. Made a new man out of him. The proof of that was the way he produced the blade out of nowhere and deftly cut himself loose. Joe grabbed the flashlight from the dead woman and rushed over to me. God damn it, Neil, Joe gasped, taking my wounds. I didn't need to look. My brain knew it was fucked and was sending me pain cards as a sign of its displeasure. Everything was getting harder. End me and run, I told him. 
We both had escape plans and enough stolen assets to disappear for life. If Joe kept his wits, he'd be fine. I had my gun to Joe. He placed it between my eyes with tons of regret in his and a steady hand. I took pride in that steady hand, which used to shake when we met. He was a better agent because of me, better able to live with his flaws. At least I left one positive mark in the world. Forgive me, Joe whispered before pulling the trigger. Tears formed in his eyes as Joe pulled an earpiece out of his jacket. The four kills he had taken out began to stir. They were playing possum? The stage kill zone was good enough to fool my weary ass. The chapter is closed, Joe reported. Say again, the chapter is closed. That was our jargon for a successful kill. Joe wasn't the target, just me. I lay there shaking my head as the bands rolled up in the distance. A cleanup crew arrived along with a support team of shooters and Gerald Bialchi. That suit was two tears above our hammer. He hated us both but couldn't knock our results. Someone zipped me up in a body bag and carried me off. Yelchi walked over with a silver flask and offered it to Neil. He regarded the 50-something like the slang he was. Yelchi wanted Joe to fall off the wagon again. Instead, he declined the flask. He liked who he was just fine. Besides, knowing Bielchi, the flask might have been laced. Congratulations, Joe, said Bielchi. You're out of the shithouse. I got up and walked over to them. At some point, I'd have to wonder why I wasn't in hell. I was fully expecting to go there when I died. It made more sense than heaven. I guess I hadn't lost my clerk with the impossible. You didn't have to write him off, Joe scowled. We needed him gone, Neil, the LG explained. The oversight investigation's a nail in the program's coffin. You were deemed salvageable. Be grateful and move on. So what now? You go over the hill and lie, the LG shrugged. Do it well enough, you'll get a nice, safe desk to age by. The guaranteed pension. You'll never have to pull the trigger again. Joe shook his head and pointed at the meat wagon. I met with Neil. For all he's done, the kid deserves a slot in Arlington. Pielty shook his head. The man's got a date with an acid bath. He needs to disappear, Joe. Simple as that. The fat fuck took a squid from the flask and walked off. He made it four faces before he killed him. An unarmed man of my talents could kill three Bialchis in about four seconds. Being a ghost and all, I stuck with the basics. I grabbed him around the throat with both hands and choked the fucking life out of him. I need some help over here! Joe yelled as Bielchi dropped the flask and grabbed to my intangible spectral hands. Eyes bulging, all Bielchi could do was die. I burst him to the ground when Joe shouted for help. Some of his people rushed over with the first aid kit and tried to revolve with Bielchi. Two of them pulled Joe back and flex cut him again, thinking he had something to do with it. My former partner's protests were fun to hear as I removed my hands from Bielchi's throat. They were mystified by the bruise marks. Walking past a gawking century, I admired his silence, UNP-45. Maybe that's why I cracked him in the windpipe and snatched it away as he died. They gawked at the floating gun before I mowed them down, sparing only Joe. As I pressed the hot barrel against his face, my ex-partner's pain expression faded into realization, relief, and then a quiet acceptance. I don't know, but I've been told, Joe chanted. Good Marines, they don't grow old. Not funny, I growled. You sold me out, you piece of shit. Why? Joe looked up at the hump 45, waiting to die. Answer me! He didn't. It took me a while to remember that he couldn't. I was a ghost. People aren't supposed to see ghosts. Yeah. With a sigh, I killed my only friend and stood up. Answers. I needed answers. Stumped, I dropped the SMG and walked out of the cemetery and crossed the street. People and vehicles passed through me. I spotted an empty restaurant and went inside. Apparently, the raging gun battle had cleared out the place. Police were cordoning the area off while federal trench coats kept everyone out of the cemetery. I headed for the men's room and looked at myself in a mirror for several minutes. Pleased to have a fucking reflection, I leaned up against the sink and took in my transparent form. My bland expression, balding head, trim beard, and a corpse-like pallor. I still wore the bullet riddled Kevlar vest I had dyed in along with a combat harness and assorted optech loaded on it. My t-shirt and jeans were shot up too, yet there wasn't a mark on me. Over my head was something I didn't expect to see, a fiery halo. Maybe heaven wasn't a place, but a status. Whatever my reason for still being here, I'd just have to roll with it. Then a broad strokes of a plan came to mind. Joe and I still had assets in the field. Granted, Bialchi would have emptied our accounts and stashes, but those could be replaced. Once I handled the money problem, I'd have to recruit new meat, including someone in Langley. Since I was fucking invisible, I'd have to do it all by email. My assets could find the trouble, and I'd go and settle it. At least I could afford the muscle to do it for me. Hmm. In essence, I'd be creating a phantom spy network. Yeah, 
Someone or some group would eventually come along and shut me down. I'd have to plan for that. A sad grin crossed my face as I remembered all the tricks Joe had taught me. That's our partnership that been mutually beneficial. That's the thing about duty. Joe and I used to joke that it was a four-letter word that would kill us both someday. Clearly it had, and then some. The thing was, I just couldn't walk away from it. Even in death, I just couldn't walk away. Now, that is the first book. This is the second book in the series, and I plan on writing more on our books. This one, The Unlikely Hero, is a 13-year-old boy who's just chilling out in his man cave, or boy cave. <laughs> Mike Hurlson, I was called the report, by the way. Mike Hurlson waited at the Reagan National Airport luggage area with a small crowd of folks from his flight. The heavyset businessman was in his mid-50s with a wrinkled black suit, dark blue overcoat, and a thick pair of black gloves. In his right hand was a well-worn brown briefcase. Weariness was etched across his face. The trip back from Portland was nothing shy of hellish. The tea, the turbulence, the screaming baby, and the serene numbness of a head cold plagued him all along his nonstop flight. Mike just wanted to get home in one piece, kiss the wife, greet the kids, and then pass out for the rest of the weekend. Luggage began to roll out, half asleep. Mike put a piece of nicotine gum into his mouth and impatiently waited. Four minutes later, he smashed a full-size black suitcase off the conveyor belt and headed for the short-term parking deck. By the time he made it to the highway, a full-blown winter storm had settled in. Mike stopped off at a gas station and relieved his aching bladder. Then he filled the tank and ordered the biggest, blackest cup of coffee they could pour. Part of him wanted to find the nearest hotel and just crash. Too bad Christmas had already overloaded his credit card. Thus, he had to drive all the way home through a raging blizzard, icy roads, and ultra-slow traffic. Half Past one, Mike rolled into the driveway of the ranch house that he and Vicky purchased just after they wed some 19 years ago. Over the years, she begged him to move into a larger place. His usual answer was, we're too broke and you know it. It usually settled the argument, but with two boys and the wife who put her nice paying travel agent job after Chris was born. While the mortgage had been paid off years ago, Mike was barely making ends meet with everything else. Private school for the boys, two car payments, an aging job, aging dogs, medical bills, and a bunch of other expenses. Brutus barked as he walked up to the side door. The second Mike opened it, the brownish little fur ball sniffed his feet and vigorously wagged his tail. After many an internet search, neither Mike nor Vicky could figure out what breeds Brutus was. Mike smiled down at Brutus as he locked the door and set his luggage down. Hey, Dad, Alex greeted, emerging from the basement. His younger son was in red pajamas tonight. Reasonably loud techno music came from the basement, which Mike had converted into a rec room a few years back. But once PlayStation 3 came out, it became Alex's private cave. The lad was pushing a lanky 13 with his mom's blonde hair and the nerdiest pair of glasses she could find. While Alex was picked on mercilessly at school, Mike figured that the kid would turn out okay. Everything all right, Mike yawned. Yep, Alex grinned, devoid of fatigue at this unholy hour. Mike didn't be that. Where's Chris? He wearily asked. I didn't see his car in the driveway. He called in about 11 and managed to sweet talk mom into letting him stay at Josh's because of the storm. Mike chuckled. Alex was the comic book reader. Chris was a 17-year-old Casanova of the household. Josh, Chris's best buddy in the world, was probably throwing a wild party while his rich parents were out of town. Still, Chris shouldn't be out on these roads. Not tonight. I'm going to collapse for a month or two, Mike announced. You're the man of the house until Monday. But Chris is older than me, Alex replied. True, but you're more mature, Mike countered with a wink. Good night. Good night, Dad. With that, Mike headed upstairs. Alex grabbed the briefcase and headed for the den. Once he left it on his father's desk, he grabbed a heavy suitcase and wrestled it downstairs. Normally he'd pull out any laundry and toss it on a pile for mom to deal with tomorrow. But when he tried to open the suitcase, the boy froze and his jaw dropped. The latch was covered with dried blood. Alex figured that his dad had grabbed the wrong suitcase. Mystified, he flipped it open. Inside was a fancy looking communications array covered with symbols he didn't recognize. Alex was about to turn around and call for Dad when the unit self-activated. A deep male voice shouted something in a language he didn't understand. What the hell? Alex blurted out. The rambling stopped. Who is this? The voice asked. Alex was about to say his name and then stopped. He glanced over at the video game he had paused and grinned. I'm Horoscope, Alex replied, using the name of one of the game's villains. You are not on the list of our agents, the voice replied. That's because I'm too good to be on any list, Alex beautifully lied. A byproduct of watching his older brother lie to his harem of girlfriends, each of which thought they were the only one. <clears throat> ah, you want 
of the elite. Apologies, horoscope. Why are you using Jimra's cause transmission unit? Alice looked down at the blood. He was killed. I retrieved his unit so that he wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. A wise move. I will relay this to the council. Another agent will be dispatched to continue Jemris' mission. With God's crazed blessing, we can finally invade and depopulate the Earth in only three more yet qualities. Alex's heart jackhammered. This was for real. He'd watch enough sci-fi channel to know the difference between real and fake, and the blood on this thing looked quite real. You don't understand, Alex replied, his mind racing. The humans found out about him. He was tortured and killed. Silence filled the room. Did they break him? Did he tell them about us? Yes, Alex replied as he noticed some role-playing gang books on the floor. But I need you to relay something else to the council. And that would be, asked the alien. To find generous cause, I had to snatch a few people myself. <laughs> I hope you made them howl like dumbass cats. <laughs> the voice on the other end said with a hearty laugh. Alex used a few seconds to get up, snatch up some gaming books, and then rush back. Yes, I made them talk, Alex replied as he flipped through the pages of a thick source book. What I managed to get out of them worries me. Explain, the voice replied, suddenly serious again. Alex flipped to a well-illustrated page with a large space cruiser being piloted by futuristic space soldiers from Earth. The humans have help, Alex uneasily began. Impossible! None of the other known races would dare impede our progress. Alex grinned as he had a sudden stroke of genius. You don't understand, the lad countered with vague concern. They're getting help from the future. What? At some point in the distant future, a group of human survivors will find a new home world of their own. On this world, they'll acquire advanced technology from long-dead alien civilization. Which one? Unknown, Alex lied. How advanced? Enough to travel through time. <laughs> the line was silent for what seemed like an eternity. By the Crimson Shrave, the alien suddenly whispered. If these humans could travel back into time, they could thwart the invasion. It's worse than that, Alex pressed. Think about it. What's to stop them from going back to before the Empire itself was formed? Shrade! They could kill us off before we discovered hyperspace travel. I agree, said Alex. <laughs> Notify the Council at once. The invasion needs to be called off. Their spies know far too much about our plans. What spies? Human agents have infiltrated the Empire at every level. Impossible, <laughs> Roy Dale. Utterly impossible! Really? Alex asked with aggression in his voice, as nervous sweat formed on his brow. They can move through time, they can study us. That makes everything possible. By now they know our ways, our language, and our science. Worse, their technology allows them to pass for our kind. They're as devious as we are. <laughs> High Command will conduct a thorough purge immediately. Is there anything else you'd like me to report? Alex quietly exhaled. Cancel all operations on Earth. If there's no invasion, then the timeline has changed to our favor. I see your point, horoscope. The, the humans would never flee into space, discover time travel, or threaten the Empire. Still, the Council will want that technology. Alex remembered something that one of his fellow gamers did to him once. So would our enemies, he replied. I would urge the Council to use all efforts to find that world, no matter how long it takes. It's just sitting there waiting to be found. There was silence on the line. Alex quietly prayed that he hadn't messed up somewhere. A brilliant plan, horoscope. Your proposal shall be taken to the council, and I shall see to it that you're awarded the interstellar blade of honor. Uh, thank you, but I only seek the glory of the Empire, not my own. In fact, please delete all records of this communication and give the credit to generous cause. The coward broke under pressure, growled the dude. True, I'll shrug, but if he dies a hero, they'll never know about me. Understood? Completely. How long do you think it will be before we can invade the Earth? Once we can move whole fleet through time, will it matter, Alex argued? But we must find that world and its secrets before anyone else does. <laughs> I must go now. For the good of the Empire, you must convince the Council to enact my strategies. No matter what happens, do not mention my name, even after the purge. I won't, Chandris. Thank you and good luck. Alex winced as the connection broke. <laughs> Take your bottle.